Um, hello, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you today for your conference. Um, my title of my talk today is Courtney Old Golden Land. Um, my name's Helen Woodford Dean, and I live up in Orkney. Um, but this isn't an Orkney accent. Um, I moved up here about till it's a reference to a Phil Rickman novel. But I also want to refer to this idea of some sort of mythical past golden age, which seems to occur in global myth. And as you can see from the picture there, um, the, the land up here, the light up here is, is fairly incredible. So I just want to tell you a little bit of information about me. That's um, quite a flattering picture of me. I, I won't be absolutely honest with you while I'm telling you these things. Um, I'm very currently active in religion and politics, and I want to be honest and transparent with you. I don't proselytise, but I'd like you to all know about my biases before I do my talk rather than afterwards. So I'm currently the co-convener of the Orkney Greens and I'm going to be standing in May elections as a candidate for the local council. I'm also currently the deputy president of the Scottish Pagan Federation. I work as a self-employed celebrant and a tourist guide and I have lots of various local heritage roles. I was the co-lead uh, for Kirkpool's memorial to the historic victims of the witchcraft trials. Um, so we've just put a permanent memorial in, in Kirkpool, Archaeology Club, because um, uh, my background is archaeology. I used to lecture in archaeology. So that's a little bit about me. And now a little bit about Orkney. Um, this, uh, these are the, this is a map of the Orkney Islands. Um, there's about 70 islands that make up the archipelago, which is of the northeast coast of Scotland. You can see down at the bottom here, there's uh, Scotland, or as we refer to it, soon. most people who live here consider themselves to be Orcadian and not Scottish. About 20 of the islands are inhabited. The largest island is called Mainland which is an incredibly Orkney-centric way of looking at the world. Um, and you can, see, um, you can see where I live. Um, it's a little bit south of Shetland. Shetland's about 85 miles or so to the northeast of Orkney. And it's very much where the North Sea meets the Atlantic Ocean. Rather, it's kind of like in the middle of these two big bodies of water. Today's talk, I'm going to talk about um, pilgrimage in Orkney as a macrocosm, about why pilgrimage is uh, seems to be a bit of a hotspot for pilgrims these days. And then I'm going to talk about my experience of uh, walking a traditional linear pilgrimage in Orkney. And then finally, I'm going to finish up with talking about a uh, a pilgrimage as a cyclical uh, microcosm, which was a shorter walk that I did every day at Orkney. Um, this is about the macrocosm. Um, as I hope you'll really enjoy the picture, this is, um, again, it's another picture taken by my husband, Mark. Um, this one actually uh, won the award with Historic Scotland, and it was taken on sunrise in midwinter a couple of years ago on the winter solstice. Um, Orkney has got a really very strange quality here. Um, people often ask me, and just before I started this talk, I was talking about why I moved up here. Um, Orkney has got a siren call to it. Um, people often say, why did you move up there? Um, and the answer you hear a lot is, I literally just had to, I couldn't stay away. Uh, we do joke that it's called the magnetic north. And certainly not everybody experiences this call. But even if you have a look at the most cursory look on social media, you'll just see um, accounts of visitors describing their time in Orkney as, as just feeling like they're coming home. I do sometimes joke that it's the Glastonbury of the North, but I think it's a little bit more special than Glastonbury. As you can see from the photograph, there's a really strange light here. We're at 59 degrees north, 
So the sun never, ever gets directly overhead, not even at midday in midsummer. We nearly always have the sun at an angle and that really gives us a very strange and odd light. There are times when the light is such that its source doesn't seem to fully come from the sun. It seems to be thicker, it's almost liquid in quality, it drapes itself over standing stones and wildflowers like a wash of honey. And sometimes it's almost like the stones and the wildflowers themselves seem to emit the light, they don't just reflect it. The whole landscape appears lit up, it glows, it pulses light, and everything becomes transfused and transformed. And it's just like stepping into the other world. It's one where you don't need to eat or drink, you just need to breathe, where all your illnesses are healed and all your worries just drift away and you just get utterly lost in the moment. As an Orkney guide, I'm aware that a lot of people visit Orkney as quasi pilgrims. They often combine a holiday or a business trip with a spiritual quest. Many of my visitors are wandering pilgrims. They've got no set objective in mind. They just seem to be infused by a hope that they will be guided to the right place or places for them. Other people come up as initiatory pilgrims. They hope that they will be transformed during the pilgrims through the process, possibly by being exposed to sacred sites. For all of these spiritual pilgrims, the focus of their pilgrimage in Orkney will often be on the sites themselves rather than the journey. The time or the cost constraints often necessitate that the dedication to the process of pilgrimage as an accumulatory spiritual system is simply not practical in the same way as for those walking perhaps more famous linear routes like the Camino. So the pilgrimages are more about visiting sites and then tuning into them. They're not so focused on the act of walking, often considerable distances from one place to another. But nevertheless, it's still very much possible to be a pilgrim because being a pilgrim is an attitude which can be applied to all activities in life. The focus for spiritual pilgrims in general are those places which tend to be renowned as being thin. Thin is a word that myself and a lot of anthropologists used to describe those places where the veil between this mundane world and the other world seems to be more permeable and thus where the other world seems to be more accessible. These sites include places of natural beauty, archaeological sites like the Ring of Vodka in the photograph, and places which have acquired a reputation for thinness, as well as the shrines and holy sites that are associated with religions. There are often places which have a sense of wonder about them, places which are easy to imagine being particularly favoured by God. And when I use the term God, whenever I write it, I always write it in inverted commas. Um, it's just a shorthand for whatever you might want to interpret as being a, a, a source of divinity or, or whatever you look, holy nice. There does, however, seem to be a universal and global belief that God favours certain places. And this seems to be all the way around the world in all times. These are the sacred places, the places where God is more likely to manifest and to communicate. They're more open and supernaturally accessible places, which enable people to partake in the sacred more readily. Whenever a location acquires a reputation for being more favoured, it does tend to become a place where people will seek to attend and possibly to gather together and worship. The place's favoured status may then gain further endorsement for human attention via this kind of like cyclical process of legitimization and sanctification over years or centuries, even millennia. In actuality, I suspect that no one place is more favoured by God than any other place. I also believe that any place can be rendered more favoured by the way we choose to behave there. And this means that we might be able to create holy space, infinite quantities of it, if only we choose to do so. And I think this is a really revolutionary idea. Pilgrimage is a metaphor for life. In many ways, it's condensing the journey of our lives 
It has the potential to reflect ourselves back to ourselves. So when we bring intent and openness to any experience, we can open ourselves to insight and wisdom. Religious pilgrims expect the miraculous to occur and spiritual pilgrims can do so too. In many ways, the dozen years that I've spent in Orkney to date has been a form of extended pilgrimage. But I want to talk now about two very specific acts of pilgrimage that I've undertaken, one with purpose and intent and one entirely by accident. I want to start by talking about traditional lineage pilgrimage in Orkney, um, this linear pilgrimage. Um, this is, a, a, I'll talk a little bit about the St Magnus Way. Most of the famous pilgrimage routes are linear and they take the form of physical movement through a geographical landscape via a predetermined route. Pilgrims usually have a conscious perception of the landscape through which they're moving, as well as an awareness of their progress through it. There may be additional sub-sacred places along the route which mark the way and build a sense of progression towards the final destination. And the pilgrimage itself can become a methodology for ensuring that when the final destination is reached, any prerequisite conditions will have been met. The sort opening will be created and our direct encounter moved to Orkney. I recognised a desire to, to do a walking pilgrimage. I don't know why, I just did. And if you want to, you can label this a longing or a calling, which are both early stages of pilgrimage recognised by anthropologists, but I wouldn't want to elevate it to that. Now, part of the appeal of pilgrimage for me is that it remains an anarchic act. And my own spirituality is one that very much questions authority. It's an, arch it's an anarchic act because in 1581, which is about 40 years later than in England, the Scottish Reformation made pilgrimage a punishable offence. That hasn't been repealed. Before then, in the Middle Ages, Orkney was really quite famous for several pilgrimage routes. The exact routes are now lost and only the destinations are known. In 2017, I had the opportunity of walking one of the newest routes in the UK, which is called the St Magnus Way when it opened. And hence I've given this uh, part of my talk an alternative title, which is me and my Magnus. You may never have heard of St Magnus, so I'm going to give you a very succinct summary of the story taken from the Orkney Inga sagas, the sagas of the Norse Earls of Orkney, written down in Iceland about 1200 AD. About 900 years ago, the calculations favour about the 16th of April, 1117. It was definitely Easter, but we don't know when, but we go for about 1117. Um, which is the reason why they chose 2017 as, as the opening, because it's 900 years on. There was two Norse earls at the time, Magnus Erlinson and his, his cousin Hakon. And Magnus was murdered on the Orkney island of Egglesey on the orders of his cousin and joint earl Hakon. Magnus's body was buried on the spot before being taken to the church in Bursey, in West Mainland, where miracles started to be reported. And in 1135, Magnus was canonized. The 16th of April became his feast day. And as part of Norse political machinations, Magnus's nephew, St. Ronald, who's Orkney's other saint, um, he built St. Magnus Cathedral to house Magnus's relics. And Magnus's bones, were translated from Bursay to Kirkwall sometime after 1137. And in the Middle Ages, Magnus was a very popular saint. In total, there are about 21 churches in Europe dedicated to the blind and the insane. You please make of that combination whatever you will. The Orkney Inga Saga lists dozens of healing miracles ascribed to him, both at Bursay and at Kirkwall. And the slide shows you the, uh, the pilgrimage route, including where the island of Egglesley is. 
Um, if you can remember the first slide, you know I live quite near the pilgrimage route. And there's also a, a photograph of the stained glass window of um, St. Magnus in um, St. Magnus Cathedral. And this is St. Magnus Cathedral. Um, in the Middle Ages, it was an important relic of a church. It made the relics of Magnus accessible whilst at the same time providing security for them and the enormous wealth gifted as offerings by pilgrims. In fact, it was pilgrimage wealth that mainly paid for the building of this cathedral. On entering St. Magnus Cathedral in the Middle Ages, as a pilgrim, your senses would have been assaulted by a riot of rich decoration. Candlelight, statues, wall hangings, two effigies, incense, singing and chanting, all of which would culminate in a long anticipated arrival at the Shrine Chapel itself. The psychological and spiritual impact of this experience would have been overwhelming and St. Magnus Cathedral became renowned as a source of miracles. I'm going back now to talk about walking with St. Magnus Way. It's about 55 miles in total, and you do it in stages. We started at Easter 2017. Um, the St. Magnus Way was opened in five stages and based on the route that the body and relics of St. Magnus may have taken to their final destination, which is the cathedral. Although the pilgrimage route was instigated by the Reverend David McNeish of the Church of Scotland, Input also came from other Christian ministers, as well as historians and the communities of Orkney. So as you can see from the picture, each stage of the pilgrimage is between 10 and 12 miles long. Each stage is um, shown on the picture in a slightly different colour. And each stage was launched uh, roughly a month apart. If you can remember, um, it's the slide from the first at the beginning. Uh, I live quite near the, the sort of the, the bit of the route that's shown in, in yellow. They are loss, growth, change, forgiveness, and hospitality, which are drawn from the story of Magnus's life. Participation on the pilgrimage was invited from people of all faiths and none. So I have to tell you that walking this pilgrimage was not physically pleasant. It was very hard work. Most of the paths were not made up. The Reverend McNeish cheerfully encourage us with, pilgrimage is not meant to be enthusiastical PE teacher. At various times, it snowed, it hailed, and it rained. Mainly, being Orkney, it rained. Once, when it was really sunny, it was too hot, and I got sunburned, and I got dehydrated. I fell over more times than I can remember, and I was electrocuted on a cattle fence once. At every stage, despite promising myself that I wouldn't, as soon as I got to a certain critical level of being uncomfortable, cold, wet, and absolutely exhausted, I just reverted to put my head down, isolating myself and just pushing on. I'm not a happy pilgrim. So what did I learn from walking the St. Magnus Way? I learned that I really love an easy life. I'm basically a hobbit. I don't like being uncomfortable or being made to endure suffering or pushed to achieve something. I learned that I actually quite enjoy being miserable and on my own and I make myself purposely unattractive socially so that I can be alone. And then I blame everybody else for leaving me alone and ignoring me. These are pattern behaviour that I recognise from some of my earliest childhood memories. I was an only child, a much wanted only child. And my parents used to call it sulking. And I did it whenever I wasn't the centre of attention or wasn't being treated like a special little princess, which is how I used to mainly be treated. I learned these things, they all came out magnified on pilgrimage. Not once did I take anything with me to share with others, not even a packet of sweeties. I did think of doing so, but I dismissed the idea. I took enough for myself alone, and yet people th shared things with me, and I took from them, and I never gave back. Pilgrimage is a mirror. Mirrors 
are not always pleasant to look into. Magnus's miracles often include cures for blindness and insanity. Walking the St. Magnus way helped me to more fully see myself and to recognize the madness that absolutely pervades my approach to this life. I learned to appreciate the kindness of strangers, the hospitality of Orkney's churches, the reality of God walking through some people's lives. These are not circular routes and I didn't walk a return journey. I had to arrange lifts and car sharing with others. And some of these others were friends and some were strangers and some were people I literally just had to beg because otherwise there was no way back to my car except a very long walk and then there was no way home. I learned how great a cup of tea can taste and how great the promise of a cup of tea can be to spare one on to finish. In walking this newly created route, there was a sense that we were doing something pioneering and exploratory. We were opening the way. There was a feeling of walking a route to create it, to explore it, to imbue it with holiness, to claim it in some way for pilgrimage. We were creating a sacred place, an archery through the land a thin place, both literally and metaphorically, by walking with a particular intention and by praying into it. And by walking through an area which I'd often driven through before, I entered into a new intimacy with the landscape, one which is only achievable on foot by immersion. But this is very much a modern attitude to pilgrimage. Medieval pilgrimage would walk either in hope of a healing miracle or to expiate sin and to get some time off purgatory to save their immortal soul. I wasn't walking for those reasons. I learned. I walked because I wanted to learn about myself, to have some camaraderie and to hopefully gain some wisdom. And I was a little cautious about intruding on a Christian event when I'm not a believer myself. Although I was coming from an interfaith background and intending to be fully respectful, I had no trouble at all venerating Magnus. I'm a polytheist, there's always room for one more. But an unintended consequence of walking the St. Magnus way was that I entered into a completely different relationship with the idea of saints and with St. Magnus himself. Saints relics are never moved. The term that is used by the church is that relics are translated. The word comes from the irregular Latin verb to carry, latum, and it means to carry across, but there are also obvious links with language. We often say that something's lost in translation. Likewise with relics, the more they are geographically translated, the more the saint moves away from the mundane. Their saints become more holy, they become more sacred, and they become more otherworldly. But despite being holy and other, saints are intensely rooted in place, and they're bound up with geographical identity and everyday homely needs. Magnus is an Orkney saint. His power is mainly sourced and centred in Orkney. There's one story in the Orkney Inca saga of a young servant girl, and she's praying to St Olaf, and he's the patron saint of Norway. And St Magnus appears to her instead, because she's in Orkney and so is Magnus. Saints are little and saints are local. Their intercessions typically provide outward protection against political threats. Saints are for the people, they are accessible. And these days, perhaps more than ever, we desperately need spirituality to be accessible, to meet us halfway as we strive and we reach. And so I did, and I still do, relate to Magnus as another layer of local and available supernatural power. Apparently, before the 20th century, many scholars doubted the historical existence of St. Magnus. His story mirrored that of Jesus too much, and it was just assumed that St. Magnus had been invented as an Orkney Christ, a metaphor that would be more readily identified with by Orkney people. It was also assumed that at the Reformation, as elsewhere, any relics of the saint and hence any proof of his physicality would have just been thrown away. But in 1919, some workmen found a wooden box in the cathedral containing human bones hidden behind a pillar. The skull had a hole in it 
which is characteristics of a mortal axe wound, which was how the Magnus apparently had never left his cathedral. He's always been there. He's holding Orkney in his hands and he's protecting us. He's still there. And now finally, I get to give back. I said I, I live a little bit along where the route is, a little bit just north of where it says Finstown on the map. I've taken voluntary responsibility for a small part of the St Magnus Way. I'm what's called a peacekeeper, P-I-E-C-E, -E, keeper, between Refuge Corner and Finstown. And every so often, like once a month, I need to check that the paths are still accessible. And part of the path which I care for passes around Los Rosdale Loch, which became an intensely geographical focus for me during lockdown. So this is a different type of pilgrimage, which is cyclical pilgrimage and microcosm. Uh, the Walsdale Cranog in lockdown. So pilgrimage tends to be thought of as an instrumental and linear practice, but it doesn't have to be. Last year's restrictions associated with COVID accidentally led me to explore the initiatory potential of pilgrimage when applied in a cyclical manner to a very distinct area of land. And quite near to where I live in West Mainland, Orkney, is Wasdale Loch. It has a small cranog on it with some stone ruins, which you can see in the picture. A cranog, for those of you who are not archaeologists, is an artificial island. It's usually attached by a raised stone path. And the earliest cranog date from the Bronze Age about 4,000 years ago. Um, some of them might actually, the dating from them, they seem to be nudging into the later Neolithic now. The stone ruins at Rosdale have not been accurately dated. They could be the remains of an Iron Age rock tower, but the most persistent local tradition states that the low walls are all that is left of an early medieval chapel. And there are similar multi-period sites like Island of Pape, for example, as another multi-period site just like this. Now, I don't normally get an opportunity to visit Rosdale very often, because normally my summers are an absolutely hectic whirlwind of non-stop tourist guiding. And Orkney dark winters are not the times when I want to go for a long walk along made up, unmade up paths. Lockdown changed all of this. I just wasn't busy in summer. And at one point at the beginning of lockdown, when the COVID restrictions were at their tightest, one walk was permitted a day. So long it was no more than 500 metres from home. The lock was an accessible holly by footpath. So I started a practice of visiting most days. And this rapidly became a daily priority around which the rest of my day. It wasn't so much that I was called to do this. It was more that circumstances conspired so that I would comply. And on those days when the weather was inclement, which is often in Orkney in winter, it became necessary to apply discipline to the task. And these are all qualities that are associated with pilgrimage. In walking the same route over and over again, I gradually built up a relationship with the park and the place, the plants, the animals and the birds, all the non-human people. I picked up litter and I left offerings, which were usually home-baked goods. And I noticed how the wildflowers changed with the seasons and the order in which they bloomed. It's always yellow, white, and then finally purple. I watched the hares boxing in spring, and then I counted their leverets. I was observed by a pair of ravens who raised four fledglings, and the family still buzz me when I visit. They've become accustomed to anticipating and then tidying up the offerings I leave. I played poo sticks with my husband when we crossed over the burn that carries the lock waters out through Binscalf Woods and down to the Bear Fur. I saw trout jumping for flies, and once I saw an eel wriggle. Every summer in every day in summer on leaving, a cormorant passes overhead as if it had been cued to do so. It was like a natural screensaver. It's like time to go, there's the cormorant. And I've come to think of all these fellow inhabitants as brother fish and sister bird. Immensely, I greet them as such. I mourned at the carcasses that I sometimes found. 
the little flurries of feathers that screamed of a sudden ending. And I experienced the good, which is butterflies, and the bad, horse flies. And I recognise them all as part of the whole. Now, I'm an archaeologist that's married to an archaeologist. So he gets more interested in me the older I get, which is great. But we research the layers of the past like a palimpsest in the landscape, readable if you know what to look for. We searched together for parish boundaries on old maps, and then as the barley ripened, we saw them appear as crop marks in the fields. We looked for and found four of the Harry Firth parish boundary stones, one of which is the Harry Firth Stennis stone, and we investigated the old workings for the weir, now broken so that only rainfall determines the level of the lock waters. And we snooped around some World War II foundations, which led in turn to a fresh appreciation of the topography and an understanding of how the valley would once have been perfect for positioning an anti-aircraft gun. What new was this area? As the year turned to winter, walking became less of a treat and much more of a chore. It's so much easier to give in to the comfort of a wood fire and a dram of whiskey. But I needed to get out into the fresh air and there was a realisation that what was entertainment for me was an issue of survival for my COVID, bread, COVID brethren. When it snowed, I was able to identify hair tracks and I realised just how active they still were, even though I was only seeing them really. The quiet of the dead month of January was shattered by the plaintive calls of hooper swans and the anguished pleats of oyster catchers. Occasionally, my presence will inadvertently alarm a pheasant or send a flock of grey lag geese panicking into the air. And at such times, I apologise for disturbing them. Everything seems so much stiller in winter as if it's sleeping, but it's so obviously just waiting and there's a real nagging of potentiality in the air, a keenness to awaken. As stated, this activity became a form of accidental pilgrimage albeit a chronological act of devotion rather than a linear one. Every part of the journey became imbued with sacredness as I opened to the possibilities of encountering the spiritual, spiritual via an increasingly animistic perspective. Travelling to an island by crossing over water always seems intense. Travelling to an island within an island seems even more so. There's a traditional theme that of crossing water representing a point of transformation, whether it's the myths associated with the ferrymen of the dead, the beliefs that witches cannot pass flowing water, or the creation of hen's ditches and medieval moats. Water has long been used to divide, divide space. So I treat the causeway as an initiatory challenge by which I enter into sacred space. I name particular stones as threshold or holding stones. I leave the concerns of the world behind and I wade into sanctuary. Perceiving the Kranog itself as a symbolic microcosm of Orkney's macrocosm, I performed repetitive ritual acts here, including prayer, asking specifically for protection of Orkney during the pandemic. Now I know that's selfish, but I'm aware of my limitations. This repeated dedicatory process seems reciprocated by an increasing awareness of the sanctity of the land itself. The land is a sentient and sacred entity, whether we refer to it as a genius Loki, a land spirit, the land rights, or even the local saints. The entity smoulders under, over, and around us. And this focused spatial adventure was transformed into a pleasure service in the form of non proprietorial guardianship. And just in conclusion, one does not go on pilgrimage to somewhere. One goes on pilgrimage. The journey and the return are as important as the destination. You may never get to your destination. You may never return from your destination. And if you do return, you almost certainly will not be the same. The motives of pilgrims have always been and they remain varied, but in general, the difference between being a pilgrimage and a mundane journey is that on pilgrimage, every part of the journey becomes imbued with sacredness. 
there's an intention of awakening, opening to spiritual encounters with the potential that on return, life might be different. As I stated, I, I work in tourism as a, as a guide. Um, you've got, I've just put up a slide that shows a link to my website if you want to check out some more. And this is where I derive my main income. But I'm fully aware as a green politician that most tourism is completely unsustainable. Tourism, as it is presently offered, commodifies the landscape. There have been times when I felt that I've been pimping Orkney when taking a party around who just want to be entertained but who have no appreciation for where they are or how special it is. I'm not sure what the future home travel will revert entirely to the exclusive preserve of the wealthiest. Holidays today are used as a carrot for too many people. And if travel no longer becomes affordable, there's likely to be protest. Tourism is a mass employer and contributor to the economy, and not all of us can retrain to be coders. Perhaps more optimistically, if we're forced to take more and more staycations, true staycations where we stay at home and we just go out for the day walking or cycling if we become more restricted geographically in general perhaps then we will all appreciate our own locality more parks and amenity green areas might become more valued if any place can be rendered more sacred by the way we choose to behave there, and if we are able to create holy space, infinite quantities of it, if only we choose to do so, perhaps we will start doing so at home or wherever we are now in this moment. And if we do, this will be revolutionary in so many ways. Thank you.